Hey guys, my name is Aaron McManus, and you are listening to the Battle Ready Podcast Book Club. Well, I'm going to call it the Battle Ready Book Club for now, but we just want to say that we are so grateful for every single person who decided to join us on this book club experience. We don't know what it is. We're kind of doing it live. We're figuring it out. There's been over like 500 people who signed up for it, and we had an incredible experience uh, kind of having a live Zoom audience. Uh, and engagement, people asking questions, us diving into it. Uh, my dad joined us and it is his book. And so it's an incredible honor to do it. But if you haven't joined us on the book club, join us next week. Uh, what you'll be listening is basically a live Zoom conversation with me and my dad, with a few hundred people in the audience. And I cannot wait to do more of these. Maybe it'll turn into a tour. So The Genius of Jesus is the book we're studying and breaking down. And we're going to do this for a few weeks. So join us next Monday. No, I mean Tuesday night at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And check out the episode. Today I've been nervous. I don't know why I've been nervous, but we, we, you ever have like those things? And so here's the format of this. This one is like an open format. We're kind of figuring some, th- some things out. I kind of want to make this a hybrid between a podcast and a, a book club. I have my book. I have my highlighter. I have my pen. I'm going to take notes and I have my dad. And this is where the unfair advantage of this book club is, is that I am the son of the author and I am going to abuse that reality <laughs> and pick your brain. And I'm so grateful, dad, that you decided to jump in on this. And um, it would open not only your your work and your mind, because I know you care so much about your books and the things that you write, you truly believe and the importance and the gift of writing. But you also really, uh, you write your own books and you actually pour into these books uh, for months, for hours on hours on end, for years at times. And these have been, I know you because you write books quickly, but they kind of uh, incubate over years of your life, even decades. And this one feels like the book, because I was with you, I think, when you decided you were going to write this, but this feels like the book that's been sitting inside of you for a long time. Uh, yeah, so I just want to thank you so. for writing it. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much, man. Yeah, I feel like and it's a lifelong it, book. Yeah. And when did you know that this was the book you wanted to write? Uh, I didn't know it was the book I wanted to write. I went to New York and I, with my publishing company, you know, and was there with, I guess, the president of Random House or Penguin, whatever it is. And I pitched like five different books. And the one I didn't have anything um, written about was I said, hey, and I had this concept called the genius of Jesus that really culminates in studying my study of human genius and asking the question is, does Jesus qualify as a genius and what that genius is? That's all. I didn't, I didn't have anything written down. And of course, everything I had massive material for, they, just, they, they didn't choose. They just came back. The, like the president of Random House said, that's the one I want. I want the genius of Jesus. I want that one. And I told my agent later, why did they pick the one book that all I had was the title? <laughs> and um, and then when the, the pandemic hit and the quarantine was happening, it just didn't feel like a, a really um, yeah, a positive environment to write the book. And I, I had two, two, three false starts in the book where I just knew it wasn't the book that I needed to write. And, uh, and then I actually called my publisher and said, hey, I don't think I can write this book. Maybe you guys should just release me from the contract. I'll give the advance back and let's just call it a day. And they said, no, we really believe in this book. We'll give you as much time as you wanted, which I didn't really want them to do. And, uh, and uh, you wanted to get me. fired. I did. I, I desperately wanted to be fired like Kyrie Irving. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, oh dang. And uh, they wouldn't fire me. And then I had to sit in my back house and, um, and then I just kind of had the epiphany. I, I have to have like, that epiphany moment where the book just sort of like unfolds in front of me and it finally happened. And I just went crazy and started writing the book that you have now. So I, I, and so, okay, so this is the unique thing about our lives in this book. And I think the, the cool, like the cool journey of this book is to go on because it's, you, you write, you've written in this space of spirituality and kind of you hate the term self-help, but like growth, self-growth, spirituality, you would just say it's a really, it's an intellectual book, but you've always been in the faith category yeah. for the most part. 
but I think the uniqueness about this book is that you've never had Jesus in the title. And Jesus is someone that I know is very important to you and into your story and your life. But with that came maybe a, an un, not unhealthy, because that's not what I would say, but a, a level of reverence where it brought a level of fear maybe to write this book. Yeah, it We're created not, a lot of apprehension for me. So this is where I want to open the book. And they dive in because this is this leads me to the topic that I want to talk about today. Because I I, I want to go some of the we're going to pop around a couple of different chapters throughout this book club experience over the next few weeks. Um, but I I'm gonna I want to address the chapters in a unique way because if you haven't checked out the messages, you can you can listen to Sunday's message, which is <coughs> which this last week was on power power, the, the genius of power, and then last week the week before was empathy, I believe. I skipped empathy. Two weeks. You skipped empathy. Yeah, no empathy. You're gonna have to do that on your no own. No empathy. <laughs> and but I, I kind of want to pop around as well to more about the passages because you have you have Sunday's message, we have the podcast, you have your podcast. So we've kind of broken down this the content on this really in a lot of different ways. So the way I want to kind of uh, take this section is I want to highlight certain topics and make it more topical, make it more episodic in that way. And so something that I always am really obsessed with and something that I've always done since I was like a sophomore in high school was that I always read the ending first because that way, if I got a pop quiz, I could at least guess where the character's life ended, <laughs> which is so shameful now that my father's a writer. Um, but I, I, something that's come to like really matter to me is I love when I listen to music, the first line of a record, the first line of a book, the first line of a movie, the first line of a lot of things really matters because I want to know all of like the anxiety that went into that first line and if you can feel it or not. And you know when certain authors, the line is too perfect and they thought about it too many times. And so I, I want to start with the first line, but then I want to go into talking about a line that's on... Um, page four, and it talks about fear. And that's really something that I kind of want to ground this in. And then I kind of want to talk about our day <laughs> because our day was filled with full of fear for me. And I struggled. And I think there's a lot of people in the world that deal with fear, but I love the way that you connect fear with genius. So are we good to, to dive in? Go for it. I want to start off by reading the first line of the book. And I want to pick your brain. So chapter one, it says the genius. I've spent my entire life studying genius and searching for God. That isn't normal. <laughs> that isn't really, really normal. But I, but I will go through this passage. I always saw those pursuits as mutually exclusive. One, a question of human potential and the other, a matter of faith. But the longer you live, the more you begin to realize that things you once thought were desperate narratives in your life were actually always interwoven. My fascination with genius and my openness to God were both rooted in a desperate search for something to translate my life from the mundane to the transcendent. Now, you're someone I would never describe as mundane. You're someone I would definitely describe as, as intricate and transcendent at times. And someone I describe you to my friends as someone who's achieved uh, uh, enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm the perfect example of someone who is still working on enlightenment. <laughs> and what I mean by that is just that that peace I think you only can get from a relationship with Jesus. Um, and so on page four, it says this. <coughs> the fear, of course, was that no genius within me, that there was no genius within me to be found and no God who could awaken my originality or at least make up for my lack of it. We search for what we lack and we long for what we fear we don't possess. And so much of my, like, my life, I'm always like chasing the thing I don't have. And I think so many of us can kind of be like that as well. But I want to ask you two questions because I want to lead into fear. But why did you start the book off the way you started it off? Why were these the first words that you began with? Uh, I think because I wanted the reader to know that we're going on two journeys at the same time. It's a, a journey in the pursuit of genius and a journey in pursuit of Jesus. And those two pursuits interconnected or collided together in my life. 
And I'm hoping that will happen for the reader as well. And, and I also want the reader to know that um, I'm not an expert on Jesus and I'm not an expert on genius. <laughs> I'm, I'm an apprentice in both. Like I'm a student of Jesus and a student of genius. And, um, and, and so I, I, I wanted that. I felt that posture is really important because I think most of the people reading are still feel like they're, they're trying to find their way both to genius and to an authentic uh, experience with Jesus. Do you feel like the beginning of this book was birthed out of a bit of the artisan soul? When you talk about like everyone is created to create and you you do something that I hate so much. You talk about animals all the time. <laughs> like you would do TED Talks and you would do, and there was a season kind of where I had just moved back from New York and you had just released Artists in Soul. And every talk was about beavers or about ants or about like bees or about like hippopotamuses. And I was like, dad, like this is getting embarrassing. Like I bring my friends to church and they think this guy works for the Discovery Channel. Like what the, the <laughs> Nat Geo, my dad should be on Nat Geo. But it's worse than you think. And, uh, I built the barbarian way on animals. And uh, yes, yeah, because I talked about lying. I mean, about how you have clusters, how crows are called murders and lions are called prides. And and um, uh, let's see what vultures are called committees and uh, and rhinos are called crashes. And so I built the book of the Barbarian Way around the whole idea of rhinos because they they can run 30 miles an hour, but can only see 30 feet in front of them. And uh, and so when they run full speed, they're not worried about crashing into something. So, yes, I've been studying animals forever, uh, but my favorite species is are humans. And <laughs> and I write as an anthropologist. I think that's important. You write as an anthropologist. Yeah. No, no. So like for me, because I got getting to watch the journey, it felt like when you kind of did that TED talk or the TEDx talk mm -hmm. back almost 10 years ago, that really th this conversation started when you were looking at Jane Goodall and a mm -hmm. lot of these incredible like scientists going, they study yeah. these animals. They study this, this, you know, part of biology. What do I study? And you study human and you under this filter of lens of relationship with you, Jesus. And I, what, did it birth there or did it like unknowingly birth there or does it have no connection at all? And it, I'm just trying to piece together nothing. No, no, actually I do. I feel like um, all my books have some interconnection together. Uh, but uh, if you work backwards, uh, the genius of Jesus is definitely connected to the arts and soul, which is definitely connected to wide awake which is definitely connected to an unstoppable force. And, uh, and so in unstoppable force is where I first start creating an argument for human creativity and human capacity, human genius. So that was the first book I ever wrote. I kind of laid the, the groundwork for that view. And, uh, and uh, in, in the artist of soul, I actually like just laid out an anthropology for human creativity and said, this is what makes humans different than every other species. And so I, I feel like the genius of Jesus is very much interconnected. I, I maybe it's the prequel, right? <laughs> and uh, I did the I, I wrote the other trilogy, and then the prequel is the genius of Jesus, uh, because it finally just connects it to the core of my own journey with Jesus. Okay, and so I want to jump in a little bit about this idea of fear because I, I you know, <laughs> we talk about this a lot. Like I have a hard time because you're one of my closest friends, you're my best friend, but I compare myself to you, but you always say it's an unfair advantage because you've lived a lot more life than I have. So for me to compare myself to someone who's 30 years older is putting myself in a deficit. Right. But it feels like right away in this book, you talk about kind of this fear of having no genius within you. Yeah. Are you talking about an earlier version of yourself or do you still struggle with that today? Because I don't, I, for me, I would say if you struggle with that with today, you're ridiculous because you're obviously, you've reached some level of genius. I would say you're, you're that would say that's true, but I'm your son. I'm a big fan. <laughs> Thank you. I know I still struggle with it today. I think that everybody, oh, I, I, I mean, I guess I can't speak for everyone, but I, I think that many people who are perceived as successful or accomplished struggle with imposter syndrome. And, uh, and they feel like they're the imposter in the room and they're wondering when every, everyone else is going to figure out that they don't really have anything to offer or there's nothing unique in them or anything special. And, and, uh, and so I think for me, it always creates that 
uh, that sense of urgency and fire that I don't want to die until, you know, I've created my one beautiful thing, you know, my one beautiful work of art that, that you know, somehow leaving some expression of genius in the world. And, and uh, so it does actually always drive me, motivate me and compel me. And um, I, I don't, you know, I don't know if you ever outgrow some of the things that go deep inside of you. I think you just learn how to work with them. Uh, you know, that deep sense of insecurity or insignificance, that sense that I didn't have any value, that I didn't have any talent, I didn't have any uniqueness, any ability. That that was in me so young and so early that um, it's it's almost like I, I couldn't I couldn't figure out how to silence those voices. So I just turned those voices into a choir and uh, and said, you're going to drive me the rest of my life. Every time you speak up, I'm going to go and prove you wrong. And, uh, and it's the part of what fuels my life. Do you think, I think, okay, so, well, I want to end with Jesus. So as <laughs> we go through kind of, I want to kind of pick your brain. I want to go into some personal stuff and then maybe we can end with Jesus and then we can open it up. But like today was one of those, I, I you talked about imposter syndrome because we were driving from an interview that we did this morning and I literally was like yelling, being like, I feel like I'm an imposter. And you're like, why were you so afraid of the interview? And and this is maybe, I'm not sure if this is quite, uh, if this was rooted in my like lack of reading the emails when I get the emails, if I don't read all of them, or if I was just misunderstanding what we were going into earlier today. <laughs> but we got invited to do an interview with a, a designer of a brand called Buscemi. And they he designs that brand like designs like a thousand dollar sneakers. They're like in like they're like luxury, luxury, Italian made. Um, they're incredible. And I knew them from back in the day when I worked at YSL. They were like a competitor in that shoe market. So I was aware, but I had never met the person, thought he was an Italian guy with the name Buscemi, had no idea. So when I had gotten an email like, hey, we want you to do a podcast or do a video episode for this project we're working on. It was from a friend. I was like, cool. And then it was one of those things where I, like, I di we didn't like end up deciding on a day. So I, I was like, hey, I'll make it happen. I sent it to your, you and you like picked a date. We made it happen. And then we're showing up and we, we even did like a prep Zoom call. We did all, like, you weren't on it, but I did a prep Zoom call with them. I like learned about the project. Never did they mention that the person that we were interviewing actually owned, like it was, it was hosted by him. I thought I was like equal playing ground. Like we didn't know what we were doing. He didn't know what we were doing. So I would be able to interview openly and like we get to somewhere cool on, on culture and, and product design. When we show up, we're, I, we quickly realize it's not actually a studio. It's his art gallery that he's designing all of this incredible art that he hasn't released yet, which is insane. And that he's just kind of wandering in the back. He was like, making his way to us. And I was like, is no one's introducing us. I know. And I was, was so I was afraid. I, yeah, it was so strange. And, it, and he's kind of a, like a, a bigger guy and he has a big presence <laughs> in New Yorker, big beard. And he's just cool. And he comes up to, to us and, and, um, and he just really sweet, like, Hey, I'm, I'm John. And I was like, I'm very nervous. Like, I don't know what <laughs> happened, but like, I like, like I retreated inside of myself and got really afraid. And we were getting prepping for like the interview. And I quickly, like I said in the beginning of the interview, I said, I didn't realize I was interviewing my two bosses. <laughs> I was like, I work for you, dad. But I didn't realize that I was actually on his production set interviewing him. And if I had known that, I think I would have not said yes. <laughs> and, and so when we, you know, the interview went really, the interview actually went brilliantly, I think. My really voice well. was shaking in the beginning. I, you, there is not enough episodes in Bad Already to make me feel cool enough to interview some of the people that you spend time with. And for you, it's so normal. So I don't know. So this is my question. So like going full circle, I, we were leaving. I said I felt like an imposter because I felt like I was interviewing two legends, but I didn't deserve to be in the room. And I feel like that can happen a lot of times. Like we can feel like we are still searching for the genius inside of us. Mm -hmm. And... Like, I know I believe in Jesus and I understand what you're saying that he has laid 
that if we are in a relationship with Jesus, that he is the only genius in all of history that can transfer his genius in, to us. But I don't know how to access it at times. And in that moment, I felt like I resonated with this line more than anything, that fear was that there was no genius <laughs> in me to be found or to be awakened. So how do we, because you talk about like the revelation of under, coming to know Jesus, but how do we like awaken the genius within us if we're kind of in that same space of, even when we know we're good at things, like why is it that we like retreat inside of ourselves into our fear? Yeah, I mean, I think that's such a universal question. And uh, even this past year, one of the things I had to put down for myself and actually made it like an internal statement to myself is uh, you belong in the room. And because uh, over the last two years, I've been more and more invited in the rooms where, I mean, I'm the poorest person in the room, or I am the least successful person in the room, or I am the least well-known person in the room. It, you know, I'm, and, and, uh, you know, they always say, don't be the smartest person in the room, but maybe don't be the dumbest one either. <laughs> you know, it's like, I always feel like I, in those rooms. And so you can easily hear this inner voice that says, um, they're going to see right through you. You know, they're, they're going to know right away. You don't belong in this room or that you don't, you know, you don't have the qualifications. And so I just started like creating this internal memo. Um, you belong in the room. And I think as a follower of Jesus, you have to make this, this shift in your mind. It's not, John Buscemi, this incredible designer that's inviting Aaron McManus in the room. It's Jesus that's inviting Aaron into the room. It's, it's, uh, it's not whoever you think is in charge of the event. If you're in the room and you're a follower of Jesus, you just need to go, uh, God invited me into this room. And uh, in fact, I, I can tell you now, I, this is a, a little bit of a dark story, but I was invited to speak in this room with all these mostly billionaires. And the guy in charge of the event did not want me there, but I did not know that. Um, someone else invited, got me in. I spoke right, um, right after him. And, and he, when he met me, he blew me off and made it clear to me he did not feel I belonged in the room and that he was not for my being there to speak. That's right before I spoke. And um, after I finished speaking, he came up to me and uh, started talking to me, followed me out of the room when I left, walked me to the car, uh, gave me his phone number, called me. I didn't call him, called me uh, within two minutes after I'm in the car driving off um, and couldn't stop engaging the conversation. And within a month um, or so, he, he took his life. And, um, and here's this billionaire who probably wasn't even 40 years old yet. And he, um, he did not invite me into his room, but Jesus invited me into that room because he so desperately needed to hear about Jesus in that room. And, and I didn't talk about Jesus in the room. I talked to him about Jesus in the hallway and in the lobby and in the parking lot and in the car as I was driving away. And you just need to always know that when you're in the room, Aaron, and everyone listening, uh, you were invited in that room, but not by the person who gave the invitation. They may not even know why you're in the room. And, and Aaron, if you can have that, it'll allow you to bring your best self into that room. But I, I feel like I felt that today because he looked at me like he could eat me for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> like he he literally looked at me he looked at me and then like looked down and like looked up he was and a powerful me, you know, italian he, designer what do you expect he <laughs> he did but there's some principles <clears throat> that i i mean it was amazing like i was i was kind of dying inside because they had given me like a script and questions sure. to ask but then i just started asking the only, my questions that i wanted to yes. <laughs> And, you know, and I was being and super selfish. Was and actually, you had some great insights. And uh, one, I'm glad you, I'm glad you were nervous because it means you haven't crossed the line of arrogance. It, that you, because when a person what? is never nervous, I just feel like they're almost like uh, too arrogant. 
they don't really realize when the room is worthy of nervousness. I'm like the I'm I'm like the guy who feels real confident at home. <laughs> and the moment he leaves the house, he's like, I'm not feeling super confident anymore. I think I'm feeling insecure. Um, but the, the, John said something that was really interesting. And the reason I bring like kind of today, up, uh, uh, one was fear, but a, a huge part of it was kind of this idea that, you know, I got to sit and talk to two people who are relatively like definitely geniuses in, in your own regards, especially because, you know, we were talking behind the scenes and John was going in going, he, you know, he wants to raise money for charity. He's like, mm -hmm. he basically said, I know enough rich people that I'm going to, like, I'm robbing them now because I want <laughs> I all of their did. money. And it was, it was yeah, kind of, it was a brilliant money, perspective. <laughs> he said, they have too much money. I'm going to take it and I'm going to give it to people who need it yeah. because, because these people like, he, he, he talked about his motivation. He's like, when I read the stat that kids in New York and kids in LA, you know, he's a New Yorker who lives in LA now. So he's like, I grew up in New York. Now I live in LA. He's like, when I read the stat in the Times and the LA Times that like hundreds of thousands of kids were going hungry during COVID because they weren't able to go to school. So they weren't getting like that lunch meal um, that they were getting every day, the, the, the food that they would be provided at public school. He's like, I decided to go raise money <laughs> for children. <clears throat> and then we, you got started talking about how we raised money and, and helped feed families in LA during COVID. And so it, it was kind of remarkable, like, hearing him talk because he's like no i have a sneaker brand that like my sneakers are two thousand dollars but now i'm robbing rich people because i want to sell normal products for like he's like i'm gonna sell air force ones for five hundred dollars i'm gonna give all of the money he's like nike's gonna give me shoes and then this embroider is gonna give me this and i'm gonna sell them because i have a brand and i'm gonna attach it to some celebrity and i'm gonna go give it to people and i we start we got into in front of the camera and he like chilled out a lot like the bolsterousness kind of went away. The confidence was still there. He's definitely like comfortable with who he is. But like, I he said something and he goes, you know, I, I think I was just lucky. And I looked at him and I was like, I don't think luck had anything to do with your success. I think it had everything to do with the fact that you have such a crazy, strong conviction about everything you do. Mm -hmm. Is that like when you write books like this, you're pretty much, you're it's like sending naked photos to the world. <laughs> Maybe that's not a good. And I'm metaphor. sorry that that, I'm sorry that's a that's a bad metaphor, <laughs> because like you are okay. Maybe it's this: it's you're telling your deepest, most intimate things in your mind, and you're leaving yeah. it for the world to write an Amazon review about it. Yeah. Does fear come into play when you're writing some of the things that you're saying in these books? Because I I don't think most people would one consider Jesus a genius. I think people of faith would go. I think people of faith are having a hard time. You talk about it yeah. in the book. And you talk about like, if you're a person of faith, it may feel offensive to you to explore Jesus's genius apart from his divinity. But I believe that we have <laughs> for too long attributed all that Jesus did and all that he was to his divine nature, other than convincing us of his divinity. For me, that line feels heretical, but no less heretical than the next page where you said Jesus, by every definition, was a heretic. <laughs> yes, so could was. you... Could you, um, but could you uh, kind of unpack that? Because I know that you have a unique way of making really beautifully theological f statements really provocative. Yeah, I mean, when you're asking about was any fear involved in writing the book, the answer is yes. Yes. And um, one, um, you know, this this weekend, yeah, uh, this family came and uh, and the husband is a uh, orthopedic surgeon, which would be pretty brilliant. And his wife said uh, to me, "You have an extraordinary mind," and which was a beautiful compliment. I said, "Well, you're saying that when your husband actually has the extraordinary mind." And then I and I said, "I think I have an unexpected mind." <laughs> you know, I don't know if it's extraordinary, but it's definitely unexpected. And and I realized I just see the Bible differently. I I, I see Jesus differently. I see life and humanity and reality differently. And, and I, I don't know if people, um, I, I, I don't know if Christians have been raised to create space for unexpected minds or unexpected thinking. And because if you don't hit orthodoxy, just right, um, everybody gets a little nervous. And, and so my books really aren't books that just affirm what you believe so that you can feel really good about your faith. And by the way, those are the books that sell millions. 
mean, the, the books that sell millions are the ones that reaffirm your faith and tell you you're right on, but it's even more. And my books really try to violate your view of reality. And they, they try to shake up um, what I think is like dead thinking. It's bad thinking that has been wrapped inside of our faith and but doesn't allow us to think more deeply or more profoundly. So every time I write, I feel a little nervous. I feel like I'm super exposed. I'm going to get a lot of hate, uh, but somebody's going to be set free from a thought. And that's what keeps motivating me. So can you open up and can you kind of unlock and unpack this, this statement that you talk about on page 21 about if you're a person of faith, this may feel offensive? Yeah, like <laughs> for instance, um, someone wrote a critique. Oh, actually, I, I think it's good. Nathan Finocchio wrote a critique about some of the things we said about ready. And one of the things he said is, you know, one of the reasons to disagree with me is that I began, he said, um, from compassion and not from the scriptures. Uh, no, no. He said, I began from empathy. empathy, empathy, empathy. He goes, Irwin begins with empathy and not from the Bible. And, and I, and, and what I thought that's a, that assessment I thought was so like right on. And, uh, because I start with Jesus and not with doctrine. And he thinks I'm starting with empathy, not the Bible. But actually, if you look at how Jesus begins with every sinner, he begins with empathy. And if you look how Jesus starts with Satan, he starts with the Bible. <laughs> if you look at how Jesus starts with the uh, hypocritical Pharisees and Sadducees, he starts with the Bible. If you look at and see how he starts with the adulterous woman, he actually starts with empathy. With the woman at the well, he starts with empathy. With the uh, person with the withering hand, he starts with empathy. With every person who came to him with a longing to be healed or forgiven, he always starts with empathy. And I think the problem is that we're in a conversation with the world, but we start with the Bible and demand for non-Christians to affirm the authority of the Bible when they don't even believe in the Bible. And, and so I actually think Jesus was a heretic because he actually began with empathy. And he didn't start with the Bible. And, uh, and I don't know if we know how to deal with that. I mean, Jesus is the one who talks about living water and the bread of life. And, you know, the fields are ripe to harvest. And um, all those are now biblical language. But that wasn't biblical language. That was just everyday human language with metaphors in real life that Jesus was using. And we think somehow that sacred language, it wasn't. It was just human language. And because Jesus actually began with empathy, he understood where people were, and he could see the world from their vantage point and speak to them from um, from the place they were at, rather than the place he was at. Well, uh, Brianna Aleva, Ayeva, I might be saying your last name wrong, says this in the chat: by using the word genius, what would you say? Would you say that this humanizes Jesus, or do you humanize his qualities in humans? Wait, let me reread this. What would you say that this humanizes Jesus or dehumanizes quantities in humans? I think what they're trying to say is, does, by calling Jesus a Jesus, does it humanize Jesus to the point where we're saying he's just like us? Uh, no, what I am saying is we're, we are like, we were supposed to be like him. <laughs> and uh, that, right. that um, and I think this is an important thing, that the divinity of Jesus isn't transferable to us but the humanity of Jesus is transferable to us. And, or if I could say differently, the, the divinity of Jesus that is transferable is his humanity. And I think sometimes what we want is we want God's divinity transferred to us. We want to be all knowing, all powerful and all present. And we don't want his humanity translated to us, his compassion, his integrity, uh, you know, his empathy, um, and, you know, and his, his, hum, his, uh, his essence. And, and so I actually don't know if we're really looking, see, you can't really see the divinity of God clearly. If you don't see the humanity of Jesus, clearly they're not in conflict. It is the filter through which God can be best seen. Well, you're still, I'm still wrapping my head around everything you just said. So we're going to take a commercial break. <laughs> Well, I just sit here in silence. <laughs> I, uh, Mary asked this: Why do, why do people still shame empathy? 
I think it's in regards to your kind of your your conversation about Nathan. I well, I think um, maybe one is because empathy is misused. Empathy isn't about my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. when, when you're all into your own feelings, that's not empathy. In fact, people who are always about their own feelings don't have room for empathy because they don't really care about other people's feelings. They only care about their own. And so, so I think sometimes maybe empathy is put into it just about your feelings and it's not. And uh, and and then I think the other side of it is um, we think that we're, we're more products of the enlightenment than we are of the scriptures. So we think that thinking is more spiritual than feeling. And so like a lot of Christian theologians will say, you need to stop trusting your feelings. You need to start trusting your thinking. And I'm going, no. And uh, your thinking is just as messed up as your feelings because it's all coming from the same place. We forget our thinking, we think our thinking comes from here, our feelings come from here, and our intuition and instinct comes from down here. No, it's all coming from here. Our thinking, our feeling, our insight, our intuition, um, our gut, it's all here. And the reality is that you can be a thinking evil person and uh, and a feeling person completely aligned with God's intention. And, and so I, it's really the enlightenment that makes us think that empathy is less than reason. We have, I, have another, I have another question from Laura Bennett. Or Benet, depending on if you're related to LJ or not. Do you think LJ is my friend? The long story. Do you think Jesus' humanity was a pathway to his genius, or was it his divinity that gave him genius? I think that all genius is an expression of God. That every because the Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of Heavenly Lights. And so all all genius, all talent, all gifting all intelligence, everything that's good about a human being is a gift from God. It's an expression of who God is. And so I, I don't, not only is Jesus's genius an expression of his divinity, but all of our genius is an expression of the fingerprint of God on us. Can we be too? Okay. So it, <laughs> I was, it's funny that she asked that. And I think that's what you really kind of, the opening chapter really is the thesis kind of, and it lays the foundation for the rest of the book. Mm -hmm. But why is it so important to you to kind of dive into the complexity of Jesus thinking. Well, if is, you, well it, isn't it easier to, sorry, isn't it easier to just believe that God gave him all the answers? It, it is, except that um, I, I think there's a reason why we don't have a lot of Jesus from the age of zero to 30, <laughs> because I think most of us wouldn't know what to do with the Jesus who's eight you know, and or Jesus who's learning how to speak Hebrew because he's still just um, using sounds and not words, right? You know, how do you how do you explain an all-knowing Jesus when he's 18 months old and he can't walk and talk? <laughs> and uh, and I don't think our minds can really wrap around the developmental process of God. And see, it wasn't a problem for God that Jesus, when he was born, couldn't talk. And couldn't read, couldn't walk, couldn't get a job, and was completely dependent on Mary and Joseph to survive. And, you know, we kind of think Jesus came out of the womb and he was speaking Hebrew and Greek and uh, and floating, flo you know, like doing miracles, levitating. <laughs> he never walked. Yeah. And, and I, Sorry. I think it's actually beautiful Sorry. that uh, God is very comfortable with the humanity of, of Jesus developing over years and, and not diminishing his divinity and and that to me is like so beautiful and uh and so studying mm. jesus's humanity helps us know who we were always intended to become it, it something you said to okay wow <laughs> you're very good <laughs> um no i'm just it's got me thinking about so many things one that that something remarkable happened earlier with John that I thought was really special talking about kind of relating Jesus when he said he was like, we were doing some little promo part mm -hmm. and they were shooting little things and he was like yelling at you across the room and you guys were talking and he's like, wasn't like, he was like, Jesus was a carpenter. And you're like, no, actually he was a stonemason. Yeah, which actually makes him more He was limited to being a carpenter. Yeah. It was Mark, more of an architect. But it was brilliant because John had walked us through his art gallery and he had just been working with stone. Yeah. 
this whole so, like, new it, it worked kind of stone. and it was kind of this beautiful like parallel to be able to have this like metaphor of that that we're even in this moment like we're still always trying to like connect to our creator we're trying to connect to jesus trying to connect to the, the genius of it but i'm always fascinated by the years and this is kind of getting off topic but you know i'm the host so we can keep going. But I, I actually had, a, I, tell, I was telling you this, my, my friend Hannah texted me this last week and was like, I guess her fo- her friend had stolen her phone during their dinner and it was like texting me questions about God. And like, I was at dinner, so I was ignoring all of them. And like, this can I wait till the morning, <laughs> which is not acceptable. I should have responded. But I was reading them to you and, and she was like, one of the biggest questions is <laughs> why, why don't we know more about Jesus when he was young? And I know that has nothing to do with the, with the book necessarily, or you did tie it into the book, but why is that something that we don't know more about? Like, isn't it something that is would be so special to know? Or do you think we would hang on the wrong things if we knew them? Well, one, anything we could know about Jesus would be awesome, <laughs> right? Now. And, right. I mean, I would just love to, to know anything about Jesus during adolescence, during the teenage years, you know, um, it, it, but we don't. The reality is that we don't know. And so in some sense, you have to trust that God uh, knew that we would fixate on the things Jesus was going through in his developmental process. And let me just give you an example of that. Like most of the bad theology in Christianity comes out of the book of Acts. And it comes out of the book of Acts because the book of Acts is, is descriptive and not prescriptive, but denominations make it prescriptive. So you have a moment where in, Pentecost, you have people speaking in tongues. That's actually descriptive. It's not prescriptive, but denominations that go, you see, to receive the Holy Spirit, everyone has to speak in tongues. And what you end up in the book of Acts is a confusion between what's descriptive and prescriptive. If we'd watch Jesus developing over the years, the description of Jesus would have become the prescription of the followers of Jesus. And I don't think that we could have lived up to the description as a prescription. So I actually think God was probably protecting us from trying to imitate things that were not going to be a part of everyone's experience. Hmm. Do you, okay, so there's a brilliant answer. Do you, I'm going to read another question from John T. Um, Question, you mentioned how 98% of children are genius, and by the time they're adults, only 2% remain genius. What is the best way to stay in touch with our full potential genius and not lose it? Well, one of the ways is to make sure that you're, um, one, if you're a parent, make your kids reading science fiction as early as possible. And uh, I mean, getting- get, Why is that? You have, to, you, have to give them, you have to give them a little insight into that because that well, has that, well, there's a lot well, to that. Well, it's funny because I've been saying that for years and years and years and even decades. And that science fiction was the seminal uh, soil from which a lot of my thinking, my imagination, my mental acuity and pliability comes from. And then our friend Andre Hansen actually pulled out a study from the Chinese government that was trying to understand American creativity. And they found that the one common ingredient among all these American innovators and entrepreneurs was that they all read science fiction when they were young. And and I, I actually think that's a significant insight because uh, science fiction is the Bible without God. Like science fiction is a world of miracles, a world of the impossible, a world where all the rules are erased and recreated. And, uh, and science fiction actually was the environment which I began to have like more boundless thinking. And, and I actually think it prepared me for faith. It's why Believing all the miracles in the Bible was actually easy for me because I grew up in science fiction. It's 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 why I I could actually begin to believe in a world outside of the material world, a, a world outside of our experience because of science fiction. So ironically, I think there was a deep connection to how my faith was translated once I came to faith when I was twenty, and when I began reading the Bible, to what I read in science fiction when I was you know eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve years old. And, uh, and I think the study that Dre highlights is really significant from the Chinese government. And I think that if you're going to, as an adult, rekindle your imagination and creativity, you've got to get imaginative material into your soul. Uh, one, read the Bible and start 
opening your mind up to all the miracles and all. Stop discounting all the extraordinary stuff. I mean, I remember when I wrote The Barbarian Way and I, and I said, you know, uh, that I was a mystic. And I was told, you can't say you're a mystic. You're gonna, they're going to say you're a heretic. I'm going, how can you say the Bible is not mystical? I mean, Moses has a conversation with a burning bush. You know, I, you know, God is leading them with a pillar of fire and a pillar of dust. I'm going, how in the world could you read the Bible and extricate from it all the mystical nature of the scriptures? And, uh, and the presence of God isn't magical. The presence of God is mystical. He, he, we're now connected to the transcendent. And if you begin to read the Bible without um, rationalizing all the contradictions and stepping into a new reality, it's really powerful. And, and I think, uh, Aaron, one of the ways, if they're asking how do, how do they rekindle that genius, is reading, reading, but not just reading stuff that are how-to, reading things that simply expand your imagination. C.S. Lewis has done more good for the Christian imagination and, you know, and Tolkien has done more good for the imagination of believers than, than most theologians ever have in their lifetimes. I remember having a conversation with, with like mom early on mm -hmm. because I think she didn't want me to watch Harry Potter. No, she did not. This is silly now because now everyone, we know Harry Potter is just Harry Potter <laughs> and not some like secret subversive satanic messaging to like destroy the young youth of the world. Um, but I remember like picking up the Bible and going, have you read this thing? You make me read this thing. This thing's way <laughs> gnarlier than what Harry Potter is. There's no like, th and then I watched Game of Thrones as like an adult and was like, oh, this is more like the Bible. This stuff's crazy. <laughs> and not like, not in a bad way, but like meaning that it was, it was a true depiction of kind of what it was like. And I, and, <laughs> and we, we, we kind of have these, we have these mechanisms, I think, in, in Christian culture, and not to, to 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 diss on it, because I think mom kept me from a lot of things that I wasn't exposed to that were really helpful, and they kind of kept my mind pure in a good way. But um, we have this thing where we where if it has an ounce of something we don't understand, we get rid of it. But we read and we believe as followers of Jesus, and there's I'm sure there's people who are on here that, that don't believe in God, but as followers of Jesus there's so much that I read in the Bible that I don't understand. And, and someone was asking a question here that was talking about like, about miracles being explained or unexplained. And is there an explanation for Jesus's miracles in the Bible? And I'm going, I don't know if any human can fully explain miracles, right? Like I think humans explanation of miracles or, or translation is magic, right? And you're talking about it being mystical, being, being, in touch with something that we cannot see, that we that we manifested into the, the physical, a miracle by Jesus. But we, you made it. You always use this joke, and I love it because it disarms every person we're in the room with. When you talk about like luxury fashion and Jesus's miracles, you talk about how Jesus turned water into wine, and it wasn't just like bad wine; it was like the best wine. And anyone who's on the fence is like, Jesus, my guy. <laughs> he turned that into a into a a, a two hundred fifty dollar bottle of Cabernet. Uh, okay, well, I'm just saying, you know, but look, miracles are miracles are a tear in the universe, and just like black holes, and yes. you know we can't explain black holes. We cannot explain the phenomenon of black holes. In fact, it goes against everything science teaches. Antimatter uh, cannot be explained in the world of matter, and and we we have to realize that there's so many things in this universe where science it can can identify it, but can't even fully understand it, and why shouldn't we believe in miracles? You know, because really, like, if if there's a thin fabric between realities, between dimensions, you know, why isn't it possible for God to tear through the fabric of eternity into time and the fabric of of, of the transcendent in, into uh, the existential moment? And and so I, I don't have any problem uh, believing in the miraculous because I I don't believe that we're in a linear construct with no other dimensions and no other realities and um so i it's really easy for me i can also believe in multiple dimensions and i think again like quantum mechanics and quantum physics and string theory and complexity theory are closer to explaining reality and and the more we get to those theories the more miracles make perfect sense okay i have a question from alana robinson 
Are there any disciplines you found? Okay, you said don't go into how tos, but this is more of a how to question, which I respect because I like how tos. <laughs> I also like science fiction. I'm kind of I'm like how to science fiction. That's that's where we're at. <laughs> are there any disciplines you found are essential to the process of unlocking genius, or is it something subjective to each person and their individual journey? I mean, obviously, there's going to be a lot of things that are very personal, and each person has to find their own path to unlocking their genius. But I do think there's certain basic uh, pendulums. Um, the more you live your life um, for acceptance, the more you relinquish your uniqueness. And, and mm -hmm. so you have to realize that there will, there will be a tension there. And to really live in, step into your uniqueness, you're going to have to relinquish a level of acceptance. And you can see with Jesus, it was pretty much, um, he was on the zero scale. In the end, he was accepted by none and, and lived completely his uniqueness as the only one who could die for the sins of the world. And so I think that there's a pendulum there. I also think that you have to be uh, willing to realign your life where you're not living a life of obligation, but you're living a life of intention. And if you don't know your intention, your purpose, uh, then you will end up doing what other people want you to do or what you think other people want you to do. And so you have to become clear and clear about what things actually matter to you. And, and then I, um, and then for me, like some of the personal disciplines that have really shaped me uh, was early on, I was a voracious reader of other geniuses. And, um, and, and so I felt like even if I never discovered any personal genius, or even if I was never anywhere near being a genius, I was going to get inside of the mind of every genius I could. It's, so I, I, I've explored inside of the brains of so many geniuses that I feel like, I, I'm a, like I, I've traveled the neural pathways of some of the most brilliant minds in the world. And if you want to expand your own thinking, you got to get inside of other people's heads. You got to get inside their brains and let their brain begin to affect the way you think. I love that so much. Um, okay. I want to be really respectful of time. And it's been one hour within two minutes on the dot. <clears throat> so obviously if you're here and you haven't asked a question and we and you want to ask a question, this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to DM it um, this week um, on Instagram and we, I will start logging more questions as we kind of d dive into this because I so much, like we've definitely built bad already uh, with a few principles or a few like key components of definitely like just hearing from people, like asking the questions and using the conversations that we would have with our friends as a part of like what fuels everything that we do. And so I think as we do this book club, like I haven't done a book club before. I've gone to Bible studies, but usually I like to lead them so I can read faster. <laughs> <laughs> Which, but, but hold on. But with that, I say this, like we, like your engagement to this guys is like the key essential thing. And as we like figure out the zoom thing more, I want to hear from more people. And, and if you ask questions ahead of time, we can like lock in and we'll, we'll start figuring out how we can have more of a conversation. But to start this week off, I hope you guys are happy and I hope you guys enjoyed this like last hour. And we're going to do this again next week at 5 PM. And we're going to email you a link to this. So I think Austin's going to edit this. He's watching one of the computers and we mail you a link to this and you can share it. Um, we might publish it, but we want you guys to have it first. And um, and there was over like oh, about 500 people who signed up for this book club. So I'm really excited. And there, half of them are around the world. So like I'm excited to, to really grow on this conversation around the genius of Jesus. Because I love the way you end this chapter is the genius of Jesus is completely transferable. His genius can become yours. So I'm, I'm hoping that as we build this and we do the next few weeks of this book club, we will grow into that genius together. Dad, is there anything you want to say? No, I just tell you, I love you. And thank all of you for diving into the book and spreading the word across the world. Hey, we love you guys. And uh, we could not do, well, we could do this without you, but it's way more fun doing it with you. I'm glad like, to join the, you. The, I, yeah, like, I don't know. I, I like a, I was getting emotional in here because like, what we're, we're like, we're a weird podcast. <laughs> Like we exist in like the 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 sound waves and like the in the internet and to find like hundreds of people and thousands and tens of thousands of people that like that think like minded in this way that we're 
we should be allowed to think what we think and believe what we believe and think differently and disagree and care about the things that we care about and to care about so many things and to all still like whether you're a follower of Jesus or you're not like we're having a conversation about being battle ready and and battling ideas and not battling people and and I don't know I'm emotional I'm excited and I cannot wait for next week um so I'm gonna open it up a bit more so if you want to invite people you can We'll send you the email. You can share the link if you want and um, just get them to buy the book and that's important and we'll be a part of it. So thank you guys. We love you and we will see you next week. Thank you for listening. Bye guys. Bye.